Good morning there, Brad Smith, buddy from North Carolina. Thank you for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you so much for having me. We've been planning this and I've been excited for it. So I appreciate you uh, interviewing me. It's pretty cool. I love being in interviews. So Pleasure, bud. Yeah, no, I'm really excited. Um, it, it, like with many of my guests, uh, we met on Twitter and uh, I, I kind of feel like that's a way I've been meeting people more regularly these days, like online. And um, yeah. I don't necessarily know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's uh, it's it's still pretty cool, though. I, I don't know what your experience is. Well, LinkedIn was my go-to. I'll probably chat about LinkedIn, how um, I actually interviewed people that I met on LinkedIn seven, eight years ago. So, I, you know, my, my theory is it's always better to meet someone face-to-face, right? But you can only meet somebody one at a time or in a group conference setting. So what's the next best thing? hopping on zoom. So it's as as good as it gets right now, for sure. And, uh, you know, I think that's a great way to connect with people now. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, and then, you know, like if you can sort of follow that up somehow in person, somewhere down the line, I think that's, uh, that's maybe the best of both worlds. Uh, so, oh yeah. Yeah. So bad in our lives, right. Sometimes it takes massive events to almost, um, Give us a bit of a different perspective or, or change our, our our view on things or just how how we operate you know and uh 12 years ago you were uh, running a, a fitness company and um your life kind of changed at that point do you want to just run us through that story yeah at the time i was devastated <laughs> i'm <laughs> like man what what happens now yeah it was actually my wife and i we owned a very successful fitness business um, I had a great mentor that got our website ranked number one on Google. We were one of the first ones to do SMS text messages with new clients. Um, and all of a sudden, we're going on at my buddy's wedding cruise. And the night before, we got hit in the back um, at a red light. Blew us 100 feet through the light. My wife had a concussion and seizures after. Um, once I realized what happened, she was unconscious when I looked over at her. I have a 11 herniated disc in my neck, thoracic and my lower back. So we were basically out of commission. <laughs> and by the way, when you run a fitness company, you're on your feet all day long. You know, I was working, you know, I was hustling. That was during, I was really hustling at that time. I was working 4.30 in the morning till 9 p.m. Like I was all out. And so I'm like, Shh, what can I do? And the next day I couldn't even get, get to the gym. I had to cancel all my clients. But that's when I realized that I was working hourly for somebody else and I had to be there in order to make any money. So I'm in this car accident, herniated disc. My wife's in the hospitals with seizures. We're dealing with all this and I'm not getting paid because I had to go be there. I had to work to get paid one-on-one. And that's when I'm like, all right, I got to do something different. You know, Not only because of my physical health, but because of my time and my future. I was starting to get stalled out as well. Like I was starting to get burnout, you know, 4.30 in the morning till nine and you can't grow any further than that. You're stuck there. So that's when I'm like, all right, what's next? And it was, you know, luckily, and I made some good decisions along the way. My mentor helped me with my website where people are asking me, why, how is your website number one on Google? How do you get so many clients? Not only other fitness people, but doctors, chiropractors, everybody I knew was asking, how do you get so many clients from the internet? And that's when I'm like, all right, that's what's next. And by the way, it's scalable. So um, that's that's pivot. And I'll talk about a lot of pivots in my life too, but pivoting, you gotta be ready for it. I don't like pivoting. And one of the things is that I like to say is try to stick with something as long as you can, um, which I'll cover, we'll talk about today, but Sometimes you just can't stick with something. You got to pivot and and go to the next thing. Yeah, absolutely. But what was your recovery like um, from that accident? It took about a year and a half in and out of doctors. Um, We tried everything. Um, You know, my wife was worse than me. You know, mine is back pain. So, um, you know, not being able to be on my feet. I have a standing desk, so I might choose. I'm standing right now. I'll sit in a little bit, probably just kind of go up and down every hour all day. 
Um, but you know, my wife was going to seizure specialists. They couldn't figure out what's wrong. You know, we tried the natural ways. We tried the doctor ways. In fact, a crazy story. Um, I was sent to a doctor that was going to do experimental surgery on me. And, you know, I'm, I'm a faith-based man and I go in there and I see pictures of God on the wall. I see scriptures. He's first thing he brought up was that he was faith-based, but it was a little bit too much. <laughs> you ever met somebody where it's a little bit off you like if something wasn't right there so it sounded good experimental back surgery i mean proof he said the proof was there we go home do our research and he had actually changed his personal name his business name was barred from the state of ohio and this was down in florida at the time and thank god for the internet i was able to do a little research <laughs> oh my but word. um but at the time, I was in the best shape of my life. Obviously, having a fitness company, when I talked to the doctors, they said, if you weren't in such good shape, you'd be much worse. So I just stuck with it. I kept working out, kept staying in shape, stayed healthy, eating good. And that was basically the reason why I was able to just keep going forward. And and now, I'm, you know, I feel really good. I've got a, a routine, a regiment. Um, you know, it's I know what, what to eat, what not to eat, what will flare it up, what workouts to do, what workouts not to do. Um, so I've got it dialed in now, I feel like. Yeah, that, that's so important. Hey, like, I don't think people realize how important it is to have your health in check. You know what I mean? Like, because, yeah. well, not that it, you know, because, well, one, it makes you feel amazing. You, you have this clarity, you feel fit, you, you operate well, you're confident, you know, you're, you're looking good, but it's in those moments like that you had that massive accident. You know what I mean? That's when it really saves you. Like, I, oh, yeah. when I, when I was 16, I had a serious motorbike accident and I was super fit at the time as well. And I reckon that was one of the things that, that saved me too, you know, just that my body, it was like, it was prepared for that. Yeah. And, um, it's a, it's a good reason. She said, if, if there's any good reason to, to stay fit, that, that was definitely one of them. Um, you, you speak about a mentor, but, or that you, that you had now, I just want to find out like, why is it good for people to have mentors in your opinion? Well, at the time, you know, I was like, I was losing 200 bucks a month, you know, in, in a trade with him. But basically he came to me, he was specialized in Google and websites. And he said, Hey, help me get healthy. Help me get fit in exchange. I'll do a website for you. And at first I'm like, nah, I need that 200 bucks a month to make rent, you know? <laughs> so at first, I think it took me about a month to really decide to, to do this. As soon as I did it, I committed though. I'm like, all right, if I'm going to do this, you're going to teach me while you do it. You know, how'd you do this? How'd you do that? So I decided to take the chance and do a trade with him. Who knows? You know, trades usually don't work out from my experience. So it's, whenever you trade with somebody or you barter for something, usually someone's happy and the other one's not. So you know, I, this guy's going to get in shape and I'm not going to get a website. You know, who knows what's going to happen? Well, it worked out. Um, within six months, we were number one on Google, like I mentioned. And he set up SMS text messages where people could actually text me while they're on the website. So they just put their phone number in and it auto texted me. And it was like one of the first ones that came out there. Um, so he was ahead of the curve on there. I was getting, you know, three to five new customers every week. I had to hire employees from this. Um, so having a mentor, that was a good place to start after the accident. I went to him and I said, all right, I need to pivot. This is my plan. I'm going to build this online business now. Can you help me? And he did. We, be, we built that relationship together. Um, we basically kept doing some trades and, um, and even he, him helping me as a friend and as a mentor, but it got me to the next level quicker. Cause imagine if I didn't have the website, I would. I wouldn't have known what to do next. I would have figured it out, but I didn't have that head start. I wouldn't have had people asking me, doctors and chiropractors saying, hey, how do I get so many clients from my website? So having a mentor not only helps you, you know, get, learn, but I think it gets you to where you want to be faster because you have, you don't have to go watch YouTube or go to college for it. You've got somebody that specializes in this one thing. He's going to help you with that one-to-one -one advice. And he's going to get you there quicker. So you're not having to go learn it all on your own um, over a long period of time. So that was so helpful during that time. And by the way, a great story. He recently hired me in November. So 12 years later, he came back and hired me for something. That was really cool. 
Oh, that's cool. That's a, that's a nice sort of like payback, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and the, the fact that you've, I guess, done so well, you know, he's like, oh, maybe I can, I can use Brad now to help me. So that's, that's really cool, Brad. One thing that I also find cool. super intriguing, right, is that your business partner is your wife. And I was wondering, like, how do you guys manage that? Because it's not always necessarily easy, I can imagine. Um, I got a sign over here. You might've seen it in my YouTube videos, uh, stay hungry, stay humble. <laughs> so I have had to take a step back and it's so hard as I'm a visionary, I would say. So it is helpful. You know, they say opposites attract, right? We are opposite in that way. I'm the visionary. She's the implementer. Um, so she's, you know, she makes sure all the finances are done. She handles the employees. She does everything I'm not good at. And then I'm, I'm the dreamer. I've got the next big idea. I'm the one that's going to go run and do it, you know, probably too quick. But um, I think staying humble and staying listening to her. I, one of the main things at first, especially, I don't know if it's a, a male thing or if it's a me thing, but I know it's hard to listen and take advice from somebody. Um, so when I wasn't, when I don't listen and when I don't take advice is usually when we fail. Now, when I do listen and I trust her wisdom, and her ideas is when we usually succeed. And it's actually taken years. I'm still learning. So I have to bite my tongue now. And whenever there's a new idea or something that's coming up, I have to actually take a deep breath and say, all right, try to listen, try not to come up with an opinion and just give it a minute. And because you're probably wrong. So um, yeah. I think it's, it's taken a lot for me to change um, because I'm definitely not used to that, N never experienced that before where listening to someone else that is going to be right, most likely. And I had to learn that the hard way a couple of times, uh, some failed businesses because of it. But now I know, all right, I better listen. It's so interesting that you say that because something I've been thinking about lately is literally that the importance of having that combination of different types of people in a business. And like you said, one is the the sort of I guess like a high level person, like I said, you the visionary, you kind of like a, a big thinker, like a go getter sort of thing. But I, I and this is just a, an opinion, like, you know, based on people I've met and stuff, like normally people that are like that are maybe a bit less organized, you know, they're not sort of focused on the detail. Um, yep. And that's why you need this sort of balance on the other side, which is the the person who's actually pretty analytical. They are really interested in the detail. They, they actually like, they feel good when they, you know, things balance or like they, they do the checklist and tick things off. And, you know, like where, where, where the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, you know, and I think, uh, you definitely need those sort of two types of people to, um, to really grow a business, um, effectively. And, you know, another point is, our communication has improved dramatically with each other. You know, the way I communicate with her, I'm, I found out I'm vague. When I explain things in the business to her, I'm vague, which upsets her and doesn't get the message across because I don't sit down and take the time to explain it. She is from New York. So when she speaks, she speaks with passion. But when it comes to someone like me, it sounds like anger or, um, you know, it's just bold, right? Very bold. Someone like me, I'm like, whoa, 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 why are you so upset about this? You know, completely opposite. So we have to commit, we've communicated back and forth for years and we'll continue doing this. Hey, this is what bothers me. Um, can you work on it? And by the way, I know what I'm doing that's bothering you. I'm working on it. So, and it goes in everything from our relationship working to our relationship um, in our marriage to being parents to our kids and how we speak to our kids. And, um, I'm, what I've learned is always be ready to not only pivot in business, which I talked about, but pivot in how you act. So I'm always looking for better ways I can change to just be better for, for myself, for my wife and for my kids. That says a lot about you, but like you, you well-rounded there, you know, because, um, it, it is difficult. I can imagine like, you know, um, <laughs> when someone speaks to you like that, cause I understand like, you know, what it's like, you're like, Hey, hey, hey just, just quieten down why are you so angry like <laughs> um yeah. but then also from her side you know like she's like 
come on, I, I want the detail, you know, like don't, don't just give me this high level stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's really cool. And I think the, the point there about communication is like critical and so key. I mean, one for business, but then two in your relationship and you have both of those together. So I think, I think communication can destroy things and it can solve everything at the same time. You know what I mean? It's a, and it's something yeah. humans get horribly wrong um, and we, we're almost not really trained to communicate properly, you know, or, or like how to deal with, uh, heated exchanges or, you know, things that trigger us and stuff. And, uh, those things can easily go downhill very, very quickly if, if not, uh, not controlled properly. Oh yeah, for sure. It's, it's also helping us with, um, our employees as well now. So now that we've learned to communicate with each other, um, now we are learning, communication is the number one thing for employees. Like if they don't know what's going on, they're, they're not happy. So, um, you tell them when you're happy, when you're not happy, um, as soon as possible. And, uh, the more, the, the more they know, I think, uh, the more you communicate with them. I mean, the more satisfied they are in the workplace, I think, even uh -huh. if it's bad, at least they know what to change now. For sure. You know, like, I think, I think good communication builds like trust, it builds confidence. And there's kind of like, no, there's no like middle ground, you know, you kind of know, like, okay, cool. This is what Brad means. And we know he's going to tell us like, um, you know, they don't, there's no guessing games going on. And I think as soon as there's guessing games, it's like, well, this is sort of, um, you know, this, this doesn't make things easy. That's for sure. One other thing that you, uh, that you and your wife do is you, you homeschool your kids. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, as well as running a business, you homeschool your kids. Firstly, I'd like to find out like what made you decide to do that. And by the way, um, speaking about communication before I dive into the homeschooling is communicating with our kids as well. You know, how I was raised and how my wife was raised is, you know, don't tell the kids anything the less than they know the better. Don't tell the kids when we're in financial trouble. Don't tell the kids about drugs. Don't tell the kids about, you know, what happens if they don't go to college, you know, for us, we're like, I'm teaching, I want to be the one teaching them all this stuff, not someone else. You know, I don't want them to go learn this from a movie or go find out what drugs are from, you know, their friends. I want to be the one telling them and training them and communicating with them. So speaking about communication, when we get into that, that has been key. I've, I took my kids to manor school. Wow. <laughs> I made it, I made it up, but uh, <laughs> yeah, Classic. Yeah. so, so Yep. I'm the one that taught, <clears throat> excuse me, taught them their manners. That's, you know, you got to be the one communicating, telling them when they're wrong. And by the way, this is how you fix it. Um, my daughter's 18 now, and I just drove with her and she drove a little funny passing a bicycle. She swerved another lane too far. Right. So instead of yelling and screaming at her, we got home and I sat down and I said, Hey, listen, this is what you did. This is what you should do to improve it next time. And by the way, I'll go ride my bike and you practice passing me. I'll, I'll wear a helmet though. <laughs> so, you know, instead of yelling at her, or just letting it go, sit down, teach her something, educate her and communicate with her um, in a way to help her grow and get better to the next level. So, you know, speaking about homeschooling in Florida, the schools are not the best in Florida. I'm not sure if you've heard. No. <laughs> and wow. we, at the time, we, we couldn't afford a public or private school. So they were just going to a public and this is still middle school. So how bad can middle school be? Right. And, um, a little boy punched her in the chest and cussed her out. You know, she was eight or nine. So it's like, why is this happening? The little boy gets suspended and we find out the dad goes to jail for beating him because of this. So one thing after another, our daughter's sweet, you know, they're on the playground. Little boy comes from a troubled you know, family, his dad's beating him, of course, no one knows that at school. And he's taken his aggression out on everyone else. She's the victim of it. And then we find out it gets even worse. The dad goes to jail for beating the kids so bad. So that's when we're like, goes along with mine is I want to be the one teaching my kids everything. You know, I'm not saying I'm the, the best at ever, in the world, but I still want to be in control of that. You know, this is what's right. This is what's wrong. This is what we do. This is what you shouldn't do. Um, and th they're going to learn from their friends and from their teachers if they're going to school. 
you know, I can still have them play in that, but um, we want to also have let them have a good life. When they're in school, there's so many distractions we found. They're distracted. She didn't do any homework or she wasn't doing any school because she was caught up in the drama of this little boy and his dad, right? And their troubled background. So that's when we decided, all right, we're going all in. And, um, and it's been amazing since. Everyone compliments us and our daughters for you know, their kindness, being polite, their social skills, which we'll probably get into next. And, um, you know, just from there, it's been awesome. And I've actually met quite a few homeschooled kids. I've had, I've had a couple on the podcast too. Amazing. Like literally light years ahead of, of other kids in, in my opinion, you know, I've, I've met parents like traveling in Argentina and in Vietnam, like with their kids and they would in the morning, they would be sitting down and they'd be at the table and do like an hour or so of, of work and uh, like yeah. homeschooling their kids like while they travel. And having conversations with these kids was like almost having a conversation with like a young adult. They were so wise, um, not just from the ho homeschooling, but also from like the travel and stuff that they did. And um, it, I, I mean, I love what you're doing and it's definitely how I want to um, school my daughter. Uh, I was wondering like, what sort of advice have you got for people that homeschool their kids? Well, if um, anyone wants to do it, it's not as hard as it sounds, I would say. Um, if you're considering it or interested in it, you know, you think, oh, I got to homeschool my kids eight hours a day because, or six to eight hours a day because that's how long they're at school. In all reality, their school, especially if there's no distractions, should only take an hour or two, you know, for as much as they're doing in a public school. That's really consolidated into an hour or two. You know, they got the lunch, they got the walking, they got the, you know, in between the teacher settling everything down. So you really need an hour or two a day. And the rest is just, I think, you know, life skills, traveling with them. Um, my 13 year old, she helps me with work. She knows Canva. So she does my thumbnails. She does pictures for me. Um, and, you know, so if you are considering homeschool, it's not as hard as you think, one to two hours a day, maybe you can consolidate it into three to four days a week. You don't have to do all five days, but the main thing is get their, their general stuff out. And when there's no distractions, they'll learn faster. So you really don't need, um, as much time. And then if you are homeschooling your kids, you know, consider thinking of other things you can continue teaching them that aren't just the books. So like I mentioned, um, I noticed at a certain age in middle school, my daughters weren't following through with all the manners and politeness and shaking someone's hand or looking them in the eyes when they speak, just like you mentioned, you noticed that in homeschool kids. So I took the time to teach them that I called it a class. This is how you look, you know, speak to somebody, you look at them in the eye. This is how you shake their hands. This is, you know, and that has gone a long way just with respect. Um, and also them just being confident in everything. Mm. It's amazing. And, and I guess one concern that like lots of people always talk about is the socializing. What's your sort of thoughts on that? It's hilarious. So I didn't mention this yet and you didn't see, but I was actually homeschooled up until high school. And um, I would say my parents did it wrong because I didn't have the social skills. Now, thanks to sports, I did have some social skills, um, but you know, they weren't teaching me. They weren't telling me all this stuff, right? So when I finally made it to high school, I had my sports experience. I played hockey. And so that's, you know, I had some social skills there, but I was still pretty behind. So that's where we're like, all right, we're going to do it different. So we teach them the social skills and also take them out, travel with them. We let them have those social skills and then train them. So they're ready for it too. So I would say they're, they're more talkative. They have more respect. They, are more forward in public than any other kid their age. You know, I see these other kids that are are shy. They put their shoulders down. Got a friend who's, he speaks for his son. I try to ask his son a question and his son can't even answer because the dad speaks for him because he thinks his son's too shy. So, you know, even a public school kid who has all the experience isn't that experience. They're learning the wrong way. So, um, if I think if you take initiative, and like I said, it doesn't take hours a day, it's just communicating with them. Even on the weekends, you could be doing this. When you go out to eat, you know, this is how you speak to the hostess, tell the hostess a table for four, or 
instead of having ordering the food for your kids, teach your kids how to order food at a restaurant. You know how much more confident they are? So I noticed my daughter who was 11 at the time, she couldn't order, she was nervous ordering her food. She looked to me for help. So before we went there, I trained her. I said, hey, this is, this is how you order. You do things in order, take a deep breath. You're not in a hurry and let's try it. And she did, she did great. And ever since she's been fine. So I think taking the time out of your day to teach them some social skills is all you really need. But I love that. It's, I like to call that sort of stuff like money in the bank. You know what I mean? You, you take that time and effort that why well, the initial time and effort might seem like, Oh, it's taking such a long time, you know, but actually the payoff is huge. You know, I mean, mostly for your kids. I mean, it's also great for you oh, to yeah. witness them, you know, having this confidence and ordering stuff themselves and, you know, being these cool little humans, but, um, taking that time to really kind of show people and tell people how to do things, um, you know, is just life-changing really. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. It's funny because my, my 18 year old daughter, she actually recently came to me and she said, I get so nervous in the Taco Bell drive through <laughs> What should I do? <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. Why are you at Taco Bell in the first place? <laughs> Um, so, but she actually came to me asking me what she, how to improve it. And I thought that was like incredible. I'm like, I can't believe you asked me that. That's so cool. And, yeah. um, you know, the fact that she knew to come to me to ask, all right, how can we improve this? Cause I do get nervous, uh, was really rewarding. Yeah. But I can imagine that's like a, like a proud dad moment in, in a way, you know, like not, you know, you're not just proud of her, but you're also kind of a little bit proud of yourself that you kind of instilled this trust, uh, you know, in, in yourself that she has. So, uh, no, man, it's really cool. Like it's, uh, I think that's, it's, it's highly inspiring. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like there's this cool movement going on now, a bit of a renaissance where people are like questioning things, questioning the systems, uh, going, hang on a second, is this really the right way to do things? And that's my kind of like real optimism about the future in the world is there's this kind of real battle going on now. Like it seems like with old school stuff uh, against new stuff, you know what I mean? Like you have the legacy media and then you have all this new alternative media and that's a huge battle and legacy media is dying very quickly. You know what I mean? Um, and, yeah. and then you have it like, I guess in the financial system and all these places and it's this kind of new era that's, uh, that's kind of hopefully going to, going to shine a light on the world in the future. So um, we just got to beat these, these old school, um, bastards and systems and, uh, and take them over. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That so goes that, along with my theory. Be ready to pivot, right? Yes, exactly. But exactly. It's very important. Uh, so, but you've written some great, uh, tweets and I think we can, we can draw a lot of value out of those. Uh, one thing that, uh, that is obviously clearly in your bones is entrepreneurship, right? And you recently wrote, um, when did you start? I was 15 selling garden benches to greenhouses, five businesses. And 17 years later, I realized I made a mistake. Always looking for the next big idea. Building a business is hard. Building multiple businesses is even harder. My advice, take your time finding something you love and then stick with it for the next 20 years. So my- I love that. Thank you for bringing that up. Pleasure, but my first job was selling VHS tapes, right? And when I was 13 years old, that was classic. That's I just awesome. remember now. Um, but I'd love you to tell me about uh, the garden benches. Like, tell me more. It's I got lucky. My my family's a family of entrepreneurs, so I think I don't think most people have that luxury. Especially looking at my back at my grandparents, you know how how hard it was it to be an entrepreneur back then, right? In the 60s. And set, you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, so my grandpa, he uh, built and started and grew in uh, a tire store, selling tires. So, you know, that was really cool, um, finding that out as I grew up. My grandma was an entrepreneur now, not the, not the right way we would think of, but she had a multi-level marketing selling Shackley products. I still consider an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, is someone that takes financial risk. <laughs> she had to spend a lot of money <laughs> to sell these products for someone else to get 1% back. So that was a financial risk for sure. <laughs> and then uh, my father did uh, custom cabinets. So he did carpentry work and uh, 
specifically cabinets for kitchens and he would build the cabinets and install them. And um, so he had leftover wood, uh, leftover lumber, taught me how to use a hammer and a saw when I was young. So um, I came from a family of entrepreneurs. So it was easy for me to step right into it unknowingly at the time. Looking back, it's pretty cool. My father had leftover lumber. So he taught me how to build these garden benches because I needed a car. You know, when you're 15, you start thinking about a car. <laughs> and uh, I, I did, that was one something really cool about my parents is they didn't buy anything for me, but they taught me how to make money. So he said, hey, I'm not going to buy your car, but I'm going to show you how to make these garden benches and sell them. And then you can buy your car. So we'd make the garden benches in, in our shed and he, we put them in the back of his truck. He'd drive me to the greenhouse. And that's when I learned how to sell. He wouldn't even help me. So 15 years old, he's like, I'm not going in there. You go in there. So I had to go ask for the manager, ask for the owner, explain what I had, tell them how much money they could make from it. Um, and then they buy, buy it on consignment and call me when it sold and I go pick up my cash. So, um, you know, that was, that was when it all started. Now, I wasn't passionate about that. You know, I'm not really a woodworker. It didn't take after my dad. So my next business was, um, I was a professional hockey player. So when I stopped playing professional hockey, I started coaching young hockey players. So um, instead of going to college, I did this instead. I just was not passionate about college. Um, I went for a couple of years to be a police officer and didn't like it at all. So I'm glad I, I backed out at the time and I was coaching hockey players. Now that's something I was passionate about. Now I could have stuck with that. And if I would have stuck with that from then, 18, 19 years old until now, I mean, I, oh, you can only imagine where, where I'd be at right now, right? I'd be thousands of hockey players, huge online presence, you know, but I recently, and the reason I made that post is because I took my daughters to the Taylor Swift concert and you heard about the big era tour going around, yes. right? And I'm thinking, how the heck is this girl, my age, a billionaire? You know, what did she do? And by the way, she's done the same thing for 20 years. The only thing she did was pivot from country singer to pop singer to reach a broader audience. But she's doing something she's passionate about. She stuck with it. She didn't change besides one change 10 years ago. And she continues doing it and putting her fans first. And I'm thinking if I would have stuck with what I was passionate about, even though it didn't bring me a lot of money, imagine where I'd be at now. How can I teach kids in college high school kids, people in their 20s. If you can find your passion now, you might not make a lot of money now, but in 20 years, you'll be way ahead. You'll be a millionaire, um, you know, if you pick the right passion. So um, it's been a journey ever since, but think, think looking back at that, you know, sticking with something. And I've recently, um, you'll, we'll probably talk about this next, recently had my, my current business for sale and the sale didn't go through in August. Looking back, I'm glad it didn't because this is in just the recent few months, I'm realizing if you can stick with something long enough, it'll be successful, especially if you're passionate about it. Just a couple of things there, but I can't believe that you kind of like almost blamed your daughters for going to the Taylor Swift concerts. I mean, you can be honest here with me, you know what I mean? Like you, I know you probably really enjoy your music. That's cool, but <laughs> Oh yeah, I, was, I couldn't wait. I was so excited. I got dressed up and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. No, but just another thing that you, that you said about your, your dad, which I find like such an important part of uh, growing up, right, is one, teaching kids the value of money right? Like if you can teach yep. your kids like what things are worth and, and the way that you do that, you know, like what your dad said, he, he, you know, he taught you to, to make your own stuff and then to sell it, you know, you don't have to go that far, I guess, but at least, you know, like your, your kid can, can have a job to do. Do you know what I mean? And then get paid, um, see that money maybe go into their bank account and then yep. go and buy something, feel what it's like for that money to come out of their accounts. And they're like, Ooh, do I like that or not? You know, but, but the, the, the point is, is like you, you start feeling and understanding the value of money. And that's what I also feel really grateful for. I, I worked from when I was a youngster as well. And I learned that, learned that too. And I think it's uh, it makes a big difference to kind of uh, your, your outlook on life, your relationship with money during your whole life. And, um, 
yeah, I mean, look at you now. You, I'm sure you're super thankful for that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I didn't realize it, but the sales skills you get from that, I mean, most people are scared cold calling. I'm like, calling? Go t- try talking to someone face-to-face and selling them something. That's even harder. Yeah, exactly, so, exactly. Yeah, those skills were awesome. Yeah, for sure, bud. So that's really cool. Um, so what uh, other bits of advice? So so I just want to question something, though. You said, you know, stick yeah. with something for like 20, 20 years, you know, that that you say you're passionate about. But then you've also said like quite a few times the importance of pivoting. How do you kind of tie those two together? Yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out because you're 100% right on that. You know, what if what if you're in a car accident and you're doing something you're passionate about? You've got to pivot, right? Yeah. But that goes against the stick with something for 10 or 20 years if you really want to make it successful. So I think if you have the opportunity to find your passion early, you know, a lot of these, I'm especially on Twitter now, or should we call it X? X, yeah. You know, a lot of these... All these people are saying solopreneur, you know, be a writer, you know, do you actually like writing though? Is it something you're passionate about? And can you write for the next 20 years? I think that's your question is when you're younger college or in your twenties, find something that you think or know that you could speak about or do business as for the next 20 years, you might have to pivot. You might have to niche down. You might have to broaden it like Taylor Swift broadened it, but you will have options to pivot. But I think if you completely switch industries a hundred percent, you got to start from scratch. You got to start from zero. Starting from zero is the hardest. I think it took six months for me to get my first online sale, right? You know, that's, it's hard for somebody to be patient for six months. Um, But if you can stay in that industry, even if you have to pivot, I think that is the key you know, find your passion, try to stay in the industry, even if you're pivoting, you know, broader or narrow. Um, But that's going to build your name up. I think your name, the value online, the Google SEO rankings, your people knowing your social media profiles, you know, I think if you can stick with something and then um, for those 10 to 20 years in that same industry, you know, even if you have to pivot a little bit, but I'm still trying to figure that out, man. (laughs) Yeah, That's a tough one. No, maybe I can offer like my sort of two cents and and also, I guess, yeah. my experience. So I, I worked uh, for 20 years as an investment banker, right? And then I was like, mm, i got to get out of here. You know what I mean? I, I really, there's something else that I want to do in the world. And what I did is I tried a lot of things. I tried the things that I thought I, well, I tried things that I did love, you know, and I was passionate about. And then I yeah. went and I got clients doing that. And then I realized, uh-uh this is not really how I want to do it, you know, like what I want to do. Um, So I think what people should be doing is they should be trying lots of things, right? And then you will eventually find the one that sticks, you know, and the one that you maybe feel passionate about and earns money. And, uh, and, and, And that's kind of like the pivoting maybe is like an early thing. Do the pivoting early, you know what I mean? Try stuff, find out what you can, and then... Uh, when something it, it's you find something that you like, then stick with it. Um, so maybe that kind of ties those kind of two together a little bit. Yeah, hundred percent. And also, don't get discouraged if you because if you're testing multiple things early, like you just mentioned, you're probably not going to make any money from any of those right away. So, but find the one that you really know you enjoy doing, even if you're doing jobs for free for people, to just to find out if you like doing those jobs for people. Um, so, and then if you actually do like it and you're enjoying it, then you can expect the money to follow six months later and then just continue growing from there. Right. So I think just, if you're watching this now, don't expect the money to come in as you're pivoting and trying everything, find your passion, work for free, find the thing that you love and you can do for the next 20 years and then expect to make money in the future off of it. So hundred percent. And there's something in there that's really important for, for people to understand. When you are starting a business, right, there's this thing called the dip. I mean, there's different, there's different terms for the valley of death and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, most businesses, like you you start and you're super excited and, you know, it's just like, oh, I can't, you know, I love this, I love this. And then you don't start, you don't, you're not making money and you start going down to this dip and you're like, oh, this sucks. I'm not getting any engagement, et cetera. 
oh no, I'm going to quit. And everyone quits like in the dip, in the bottom, you know, like that's why like 90% of businesses never make it is because you don't actually have that patience and the consistency. Well, maybe you have the consistency, but you don't have the patience um, to carry on. You know, you can't see like the light at the end of the tunnel. But some, you know, if you had just waited maybe one more week, one more month, that was when you might have got your first customer. And that's what people need to realize. This is not an easy yeah. thing to do, you know, like running a business. And, and you're going to have to be prepared for that dip because that's where most people give up. But if you carry on, then that's where you are. You know, the, the light is just around the corner. So so do do carry on because um, it's worth it in the end. If you're 100% passionate about it, you can carry on, right? But if you find yourself, you know, wanting to back out, maybe you weren't 100% passionate to keep it going. But you're right. The dips and valleys, you got to go, you're going to get real excited. Then you're going to get really discouraged. Right. And then if you can wait it out, you'll start getting excited again. It's, it's great. I mean, people have to trust you. You have to be, and this is my new, you know, tagline is stand out, be different and be the authority. And that doesn't happen overnight. Hmm. No one's going to know that you are the expert at that overnight as you're testing things out. So, you know, stick with it and build that expertise and if you can wait it out and as long as you love it you're good yeah for sure you, you share a lot of good advice but and, and I'm, I'm definitely listening to a lot of what you you're saying that you that you post and um uh definitely yeah really really enjoy it so thanks for that uh you mentioned thank you, man. Thank you. you mentioned on thanks for your beach pictures no <laughs> my pleasure but <laughs> you you mentioned that uh you took a break from social media for a year what was your reasoning behind that yeah, it was kind of a twofold. Um, number one was it was affecting my family time. Um, I don't know if you're going to bring up that I haven't watched the news in over a year now. And I stopped watching the Weather Channel as well. I Actually, I looked outside and it's raining right now. So that's all I knew. Mm -hmm. That's um, all you need. Eh? <laughs> but I found myself scrolling. I was on the hamster wheel, man. And uh, once you find yourself scrolling and you are you have your dinner and you sit on the couch with your family. And if you're scrolling on Facebook, you know, go look in the mirror, <laughs> put your phone down and go look in the mirror and be like, what's wrong with me right now? And I got caught in the cycle. So what actually grew my business was videos, YouTube. I've had a YouTube channel for, I think since 2016, I interviewed people I met on LinkedIn, just like this to build relationships with people. Um, I was the creator and that's what grew my business. Well, last summer, I found myself as the consumer and not the creator. I stopped making YouTube videos. Um, and I started just scrolling that that doesn't get you any new business and it doesn't give you any brownie points with the family. So, um, that's when I realized, all right, every year I try to make a change. So I stopped, I stopped cussing five years ago and I haven't cussed since. So that's pretty cool. Um, I stopped watching the news last year. And I deleted social media apps from my phone last fall. And I went a whole year without Facebook. I still don't have Facebook. I have a team that uploads for me. Um, but, you know, that was the main one, scrolling, 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 scrolling. So, um, but it's been incredible. The, how I feel, my relationships is just so much better. Um, there's no anxiety. Uh, there's no stress. You know, the more you, I scrolled, the more anxious I got, especially when you start seeing news stories which was my turning point to stop watching the news when I started see, seeing those as well. So it's been awesome. I want to encourage anyone, anyone that um, can, you know, delete it from your phone at least because you can still do your business stuff. And that was the main thing. How do you still do business stuff if you don't have social media? If you do it from your laptop or computer, it's much better. You don't, you know, you're not sitting at your computer or most of the time not laptop during family time. So it's definitely helpful. So how have you find it now, like rejoining, say Twitter, like what, what are you doing something different? Only on the computer. So that's the main difference is just on the computer. Um, yep. Okay, cool. But, and how have you found it though? Like, so you've come back after this break, like, do you sometimes go scrolling a little bit and find yourself getting anxious or do you have this kind of different mindset and approach to being online now on social media? Um, no, I think, I think I have felt that. Yeah. So you can scroll a little bit on your computer even, and you see a news story 
I think it's the news that really get affects me. So I see a news story even on social media and you can just feel it. Like, I don't know if it's anxious or anger or annoyance. Um, and as soon as I have that feeling, I'm like, all right, shut it down. I don't, you know, I can, but I'm very self-aware on that feeling now, which is crazy. I never had that. Could I was never self-aware enough to realize that. But if you go that long without it, and then you put it back into your life, you're like, holy cow, I don't want to feel like that again. So, yeah. Pretty cool. I don't think people understand like, you know, the, the feeling that it actually generates. Um, and like you said, you, you're almost operating in this sort of sense of anxiety in the state of anxiety. And you are, you also don't even necessarily realize how like addicted you are to the scroll. I mean, I, I, I challenge people to wake up in the morning and not turn your phone on for two hours. Like, honestly, it's like, it's almost like you, you, you get to that hour and you're like, okay, where's my phone? You're like hands reaching for it. That's how addicted we've become to it. It's so crazy, but like, and it's, it, it's kind of worrying how, how addictive it is. I saw a crazy stat that, um, I think the most time on TikTok right now is six or 7 a.m. Because the very first thing a young adult does when they wake up is open TikTok. Um, so between that six to eight a.m. spot is the most, you know, TikTok usage because of that. Because that's the first thing they want to check, see if they got any more likes or anything. No, it's crazy, but I mean, I don't think what people understand is like when you wake up in the morning, right? Your your brain is like you're foggy, you know. Even if you're like the super morning person, it doesn't matter. You your brain is still foggy. It's not wired properly. It's not ready to consume, um, especially bad news, you know? So like, you know, you might wake up and you turn your phone on and I don't know, you get like a, a text message or a WhatsApp message. And it's like, I don't know, something bad news that will literally ruin your whole day or for, yeah. probably for the kids on TikTok. They're like, oh, they posted something last night and they, they woken up and they want like, 20,000 likes and they've got like 4,000 and they now they're devastated for the day, you know, and it's like you, you depressed. Exactly. Yeah. What, what you need to do is you need right. to give yourself the time in the morning um, to just sort of get into your own flow, uh, get control of your day, let your, you know, just let your, your mindset sort of, um, I don't know, just get some clarity and some control of your own mindset. And then you're actually ready to consume information, you know, and if it is bad, your reaction is much better. You're like, oh, it doesn't really matter because I've already been for a run and I feel great and whatever. That's cool. But uh, it's not how most people are operating, I don't think. Well, um, you're spot on about that. I mean, the morning thing, I want to, I'm actually, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to change next because I like doing something different every six months. Um, over the summer, I we have a boat. So we go out on the boat you know, two or three times a week. And I actually missed three boat days because I checked the weather and said it was going to rain and it ended up never raining. And so we didn't go out th three times in a row. And I'm like, see ya weather channel. So I don't check the weather um, anymore. If I wake up and it's raining, it's raining. If it's not, it's not, you know, of course, I'm not going to take a chance and go out there if there's a potential risk for a hurricane, but I'll be self-aware that way. But I stopped even watching the weather over the summer. That was my last change. And that felt amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my, ne my next one, you know, going off of your morning routine is the first thing I do when I wake up is I check my emails. And I'm not sure if you've heard of Dan Martell. He's a big software um, as a service coach. Uh, and his last YouTube video was, you're not a millionaire if you check your emails. Hmm. Now, that made me think, wait a second. First thing I do every morning is check my emails. <laughs> so, his, you know, his video had to do with hiring a virtual assistant to manage your emails for you. But for me, it just opened my eyes. You know, why is the first thing I'm doing checking my emails? Okay, I quit social media, you know, checking. That felt great. So how about I stop checking my emails until later on or until I get on my computer? So I think that's going to be my next change. I, I think you will realize and feel that this might be one of the best changes that you do to your day. But honestly, it is, it is a game changer. You know what I mean? Like, even if it's like 30 minutes and you, and you go outside and you just 
do a little bit of stretching or something like that and say how oh, good morning to the sun you know what i mean um yeah and then you go okay cool now i'm going to go turn on my computer and and check the email you you'll you'll see your your reactions will be be totally different so highly highly recommend it but um because i mean your email's another one i didn't even think think of that now like but yeah i mean you have these guys in the corporate world I think I think BlackBerry is to blame, to be honest with you. When everyone was getting got Blackberries back in the day, you know, and now all of a sudden you could check emails and stuff at home. But uh, you know, people in the in the corporate world, like they they like that's what they do. They they wake up and they check the emails because I don't know, maybe some some something they need to check. You know what I mean? And um, they don't realize like what impact that is having on them. That's for sure. So so yeah, I like that change, but. Um, there's another thing that you mentioned because you actually wrote, I think it was on your birthday, you said these things you wrote, you wrote over the last year. Um, I basically, uh, I'm one year Facebook sober. You deleted the phone. Um, I'm 1.5 years new sober, no TV. Five years cussing sober, six months weather channel, eight months toxic friend sober. And the next stop was stop drinking Diet Coke. Um, how is that going, bud? Horrible, man. I failed. <laughs> But I will tell you, um, I'm not a New Year's resolution guy. I'm a every change something every six months type of guy. So this is my six months. And I think I'm going to do two for one. I have to stop the Diet Coke. So um, I'm 100% on board um, January 1st. I'm done with that. So I'm drinking as much as I can right now. I'm sure you are. <laughs> which is the wrong way to go. The wrong sure. way to go. And I think I'm going to do 100% the Diet Coke quitting. And, um, and I think hundred percent on the emails as well. I'll commit to it now, man. So you better follow up with me in a couple of weeks and say, I hope you stop checking those emails. Yeah, so I'm doing a two for one this year and it's not it's, a new year's resolution thing. It's a uh, every six months, how can I improve my life thing? That's really what I'm looking for. I, I really think that's a great thing to do, you know, like, um, for you know other people to consider as well. Like we, we, we all do something bad that we know we shouldn't be doing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so, so why do it? You know, it's so stupid, really. I mean, humans are, we're so fascinating, really. You know, we, we do things that sort of don't benefit us and, and we know that they don't benefit us. Um, and, but then we struggle to stop doing them. It's so crazy, but, um, it is just we know put, what's making us feel bad. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting thing about the diet Coke, but I used to work with this lady, right? It was crazy, but like she used to, she used, she was, I thought she was like 60. Okay. She, she used to come to work with, um, she had this Gucci bag, right. And, um, she would fill it. I think she could fit eight Diet Cokes in it. Um, that, and, and she would, uh, she would come to work and you'd be sitting in a meeting and these would be like big meetings, you know, like at, I don't know, 8 AM in the morning. And then she would sit there and she would take her little Gucci bag out and she would like take out this diet coke and she'd go and like in the middle of this 8 a.m meeting she'd open up a diet coke and i'd be like jesus that's weird anyway but she, I, I found out that she used to drink 18 a day diet cokes Holy a day cow. and then i found out that she was only like 45 she wasn't 60 she I was Holy. Like, oh i believe it now I know why, because you, and, and then, then, then it was funny. One night we were out and I was, uh, I was having a chat to her and, and she was like, she was like, oh, I don't drink. I'm like, oh yeah, that's cool. Um, she's like, yeah, but you know, so I, I, um, that's why I drink Diet Coke. And I was like, jeepers, you know, I didn't say it to her, but I was like, you need to really quit that habit. Cause that might be worse. Not doing you any good, but, but you know, she would, yeah. She would not just have her like six pack in her in her um, handbag, but she would also carry like more in another bag because she had to bring them kind of all to work each day. You know what I mean? On the trains in London, <laughs> it was just so crazy. Oh but my. yeah, but you're right. It, it'll age you. It'll it'll bring your you know all your levels down. All your hormone levels are down. Yeah, you know, and it's and I'm I'm sure it's a a cancer causer. You know, mm -hmm. who knows what's in there? So. I think it's the whole, you know, is it coffee or drink that? Some, you know, what yeah. are you going to feel better on? So it's probably better not to do either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 so interesting. But uh, one thing I'd like to find funny. out a little bit more about is uh, the, the toxic friendship thing. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Because I think many people in their sort of circles, you know, they have people that are effectively toxic or energy suckers, 
and not necessarily serving them, but it's quite difficult to sometimes like, how do you sort of get yourself away from them? What was, what, what did you do? Man, that, that was a tough one. It was, a um, actually an argument between my wife and I as well. Um, at the time I didn't agree with it, which I was, it, see, I'm always the idiot, man. <laughs> and, um, I just, I, then I got to change and it's all better, you know? So that's the key. It was, it was weird. My wife was going through emotion, some emotional things. And whenever she was around, um, our friends, she would get anxiety. She wouldn't, she'd want to leave. She'd get upset. She'd get angry. Um, she just didn't want to deal with them. You know, at the time it was more of what she was going through emotionally that is good. We're good now. And she's like, no, we're not hanging out with them. No, we're not hanging out with them. And then we watched, you know, Alex Hermosi. Yes. He did a YouTube video about basically firing and getting rid of all of his friends. Um, so anybody that made him feel bad or feel down or not encouraged, he removed them from his life. Anyone that built him up and encouraged him and made him feel good after they were together, he would do the same in return with them but he would leave the relationship feeling good about himself. Now we have friends that, you know, they think it's funny to talk crap to you, to tell you, you know, what, how bad you look that day, or, you know, tell me I'm short because I'm only five, eight, you know, it doesn't bother me, but I don't, you don't feel good after hanging out with those people. Right. So we started seeing that I, I showed her that video. I think we went mountain biking um, in the mountains and we watched that video and it's basically saying, if you want to get to the next level, and we've heard this before, it's not him telling us this, but that video just made us super aware. If you want to get to the next level, you know, surround yourself with people at the level you want to be at, you know, don't surround yourself with people that are going to bring you down. And so we started evaluating, all right, who makes us feel good, encourages us and motivates us in our life and who doesn't. And if you don't make me feel good, if you don't provide any positivity to my life, why do I have you in my life? because I want to go party with you or because I know we're going to go get drunk together or that doesn't bring, build you up. That makes you feel worse. So, um, you know, whether it's a friend that, you know, is bringing you down because they think it's funny as a joke, or if it's a friend that is always looking for the next party or anyone that doesn't make you feel good. We, we didn't call them and say, don't talk to me again, but we started backing away. And so at this point we have less friends, but the friends we do have are high level CEOs, are professionals that are above us in their in life and build us up, make us we feel good after hanging out with them. And it's it's been pretty cool, man. Um, if you haven't tried it, you probably have, but anyone watching, like try it. Evaluate how you feel after you hang out with friends or family. By the way, even family could bring you down. Do you feel good? We've taught our nieces and nephews this as well, um, who actually were interns and now they work for us. They have people in their life that's family that brings them down, that talks crap to them, tells them how ugly, how bad they are. Um, and when they're done, you know, that person was joking as a family member, but it's not funny, you know? It, so we said, evaluate how you feel after. So think about it. Next time you hang out with somebody, when you leave and you're driving home, do I feel good about myself or do I feel kind of down or bad about myself and then remove it and always look for that next step to grow yourself. I think. How did you go about doing it though? Did you, did you just like slowly remove yourself, stop getting in touch uh, or, or do you use it as like a real growth opportunity and like have a conversation with the person? We've had the conversation with two of them. Wow. That was tough. That's super uncomfortable for me. My wife can do it with her eyes closed. <laughs> so I'm trying to learn from her on that. Cause it's for me, my personality is I don't want to upset somebody and it's so uncomfortable to get in that position, but how am I going to grow if I never get in that position as well? So basically said, we we're done partying. We're done doing this. We're doing, done doing that. And, you know, we can't hang out with you guys unless you decide to change. You don't have to change, but this is just where we're at. And, you know, who knows how long it'll be, but maybe it'll probably be forever. So. Man, that's commendable. Like, uh, there must've been a yeah, a real kind of awkward, um, situation, I guess. 
Oh yeah. I mean, one, one of them is just because he cusses so much. I mean, every other word is the F word. I don't cuss at all now. And I'm not looking down on them, but you're not building me up either. You're making fun of everyone. You're giving everyone a hard time. You can't say it two words in a row without a cuss word in them. There's no value there. Like you're not building me up. You're not building the people around us up. And it's just talking in circles. So it's not worth it. Mm. I love it, bud. I love it. There's, there's so much in there, you know, and, and I wasn't actually even expecting you to go, no, we had the conversation. I was just like, oh, cool. Let's, let's ask, you know, <laughs> that's a, that's a real, yeah. real strong thing to do. So, um, you know, and, and the now there's many that we didn't have a conversation with at all, by the way, just back to back to way and basically change what we do as our hobbies instead of hanging out with them. So. Yeah, I know. I mean, geez, I can imagine just having two of those conversations was was tough enough. Um, but but the the cool thing, I like, I really encourage uh, tough conversations. I think they are like some of the most important things that that anybody should do. You know, because when you avoid those things, it's always like on the back of your mind. You know, it's actually causing you a bit of anxiety when you're not having tough conversations. Um, but when you learn to how to have a tough conversation it actually gives you a lot of confidence. It's, it's this new skill. It's a skill set that sort of takes you to the next level is, is having a tough conversation. And I truly believe people should uh, try and engage in those as much as possible. Um, so, so what is that, you guys? Is that easy for you? Is that like part, part of your personality or are you the opposite? Is it hard to have those conversations? Cause it's easy for my wife, hard for me. So it's become much easier for me. I, I never used to kind of like, I don't know, I never used to really maybe think about it if I'm truly, truly honest, but I think about these things much more these days and I'm extremely comfortable to, to have a tough conversation with somebody. Um, and yeah, it, it, I, I actually think having a tough conversation um, generates a lot of kind of uh, respect and, um, and almost like, you know, it, it's not, it, it, it builds trust as well because people know where they stand with you. Um, yeah. and, and what you'll find probably with those, that couple that you had the, the conversation with is that it might come full circle, you know, and they'll be like, wow, that was actually a really important part of our life. That, 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 that interaction that we had where you guys said that to us, because it's made us actually look at ourselves a little bit differently. You know, hopefully that's, that's the result, but not always, but it might be, you know what I mean? And that's, that's the good, the, one of the good reasons to have tough conversations. I think the respect thing goes a long way. Even if you're not scared to lose them forever, it's, I think, easier to have that conversation. If you're, if you're worried about that, it's a lot harder. You're like, oh, they're going to get mad at me. And then, but once you realize, all right, it's not really a big deal if they never talk to me again. So I don't care if they're mad. I'll just have to be straight up. But going along with that is also what I've been thinking a lot about in business is, how can you, and I said earlier, be different and stand out, you know, not in, just in business, but in relationships, because that could change them as well. That could improve their life. They might make a change because you made a change first. And now they're seeing how successful you are, how happy you are, how awesome your kids are. And they're like, what's different about them? You know, let's maybe go back to that conversation or, you know, what's, why are they so different? that it stands out to me. All right. Maybe I want to make that change too then. So I love, what, I love it. If more and more people followed that and made changes like that. It's so feels so good. That's one of the most important things I reckon you've said, like, and people need to understand that you lead through action, right? Uh, if you want to see a change in somebody, change yourself first. Like you'll be so surprised at, the results you get, as opposed to telling somebody what to do, if you just go and you make that change yourself within yourself, or you go and you do something uh, like that's kind of against sort of mainstream or what, what society does. I remember when I, years and years ago, I, I stopped drinking. And, you know, at the time I got ragged by my buddies and like, what are you doing? And, oh, you know what I mean? Like, that's just what buddies kind of do, you know, but they rag on you. Exactly. Yeah. But there was, there was a couple of guys that came up to me on the side and they were like, mm, I really dig what you're doing. I want to do it too. 
and but but they were too scared to do it i was like well why don't you you know and this is, this is the weird thing about humans they really want to do something but they, they they're too scared to do something that's really good for them because they're almost worried about what people are going to think and also what their life will look like without say booze in their life you know and partying it's like i don't know it's so it's, it's just fascinating to me how we how we kind of think and and operate afraid to lose their friends but by the way, they could have kept you as the best friend, which probably mattered more than their 10 other ones that were continued to drink. So yes. they stuck with the 10 instead of sticking with you and you guys build, you know, continuing to grow together. They, they, they think don't realize, people don't realize that. Yeah. Sorry, man. They think about what they're going to lose rather about what they're going to gain. Exactly. Yeah. It's so how much have you gained, if you don't mind me asking, since you quit drinking is, I bet it's been incredible. But it's been life changing. I mean, you know, first of all, the the clarity that you have um, mentally is is huge. You know, not waking up like on a on a Monday morning and um, feeling like groggy. You know, and probably for a couple of days uh, is amazing. And yeah, I mean, it's just I, I can't imagine what it would be like to to have a drink these days. You know, like uh, and and feel like. If, what what I would I think I'd be drunk over like a a, a shot of whiskey sort of thing, um, <laughs> but but yeah I mean the, the it, it's I guess maybe it's a little bit difficult now to kind of gauge like the um the, the, I guess the tangibility of it, um, but but I do know that you know um, I see the world differently I think differently um, you know even when it comes to say maybe even the financial side of things like the amount of money oh, I've yeah. saved by not going out partying and therefore that's also given me much more of a runway to experiment with other things in my life you know i'm like i'm going to take a couple years off here because i save you know a hundred thousand pounds by not drinking and partying three four times a week um yeah and now that money i'm going to use and i'm going to take two years off to kind of discover what it is what i want to do in life and I don't think people even think about it that way. You know what I mean? Like you, you generate so many bad habits from boozing. You feel so bad. You spend so much cash, you know, of yeah. course you do also have a good time and, and these sort of things, but it's, it's kind of short, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and that for me, the, the benefits far outweigh the, the sort of, um, you know, the negative side of, of boozing. So, so yeah, I think it's been, well, it goes, yeah, it goes along with how you feel after and you don't feel good after you know, after I help somebody grow their business, I feel great. Yeah. <laughs> after I help my kid accomplish something, I feel great. After I go out drinking, I feel like crap. So same thing, hang out with certain friends, you feel bad. So we, we stopped drinking in July, um, actually. And it's been, oh, by the way, all the money I'm going to save from Diet Cokes, by the way, I'm going to put towards um, advertising. <laughs> there you go, bud. <laughs> your your advertising revenue just went up a massive amount, or your budget, should I say? <laughs> that's right, Tw twenty bucks a month. Yep, going <laughs> uh, uh, classic. <laughs> but so, but you're that's very... awesome, man. I'm proud of you for doing that. Mm, thanks very much, bud. So you're a very inspiring guy. Um, one of the things that you talk about is faith based leadership. Can you just tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Um, born and raised a Christian. I had a big rebellious age where I dropped off and went crazy, got it out of my system. But, um, man, we've, I've been through some hard times, the car accident, um, some things with my daughters who we didn't speak about this, but I actually adopted uh, my daughters. They're my, my wife's daughters. And, um, they had a horrible past with their, their father that we got through and that I helped was able to help with. And I've since adopted them and, you know, faith got me through it got me through the accident, gets me through everything with business. Like, Hey, if everything fails today and, and we all die, I'm good. Like I'm, I'm going to a better place. You know how good that feels? It's like, you know, I don't care about losing a friend because I know I'm going to be better after it's almost that same sort of feeling. So I know that, you know, God's got a plan for me. And if I just follow and listen and keep my ears open and I'm willing to change and willing to pivot and I listen to my wife, then I'm always trying to do the right thing. Um, I think it's all planned out for me and I'm just going to keep going down that road. Um, it also goes a long way with, I think, trust, you know, there's so many gurus and cool people online and try, you know, businesses out there that all of my clients hundred percent trust me. They know I'm always going to do the right thing. They know that, you know, I'm out, 
I'm doing whatever it takes for them. I'm honest. I'm putting them first. So I think that goes a long way in business too. When people see that in you that, Hey, listen, I'm not a scammer. I'm trying to do the best thing for my family. Best thing for you. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, and Hey, God's leading the way and I'm just in it for the ride. I love that. But I think, I, I don't think it matters if you say, uh, believe in God or believe in, in something else, but, but realizing that you are part of something greater is yep. such an important thing to realize as a human, you know, like oh, yeah. we're all on this planet. We're all part of this huge ecosystem. We're all part of this, I don't know, energetic field, um, greater consciousness, like whatever it is you, you want to call it. We are part of something amazing that has so many unanswered questions. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So you are part of something great. Um, and just, just believe in that. You know what I mean? That is, that is our fallback. We're, we're part of something amazing. Um, so interesting, but I was re I was thinking the other day, right? No, it was actually yesterday. I, I was reading this article about the, the sun and how there's this massive, like black, um, hole that's sort of developed in the sun, like sort of last year or something. And we're in this real wow. interesting phase It's called the a solar minimum, as opposed to what you might read in the, in the, in the newspapers and, ma and mainstream news, but like the sun is apparently, um, you know, sort of getting like weaker, you know, in, 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 or has a cycles, should we say, and it's, it's going in, it's not, not as maybe as strong as it, as it was. Um, wow. but it changes all the time. You know what I mean? It changes all the time. But, but I was just thinking about the sun, like, like think about the sun, but like, I mean, it's this ball of fire in the sky that effectively yep. gives the earth life like that everything. is that is everything you know what i mean i'm like like i can't even if you try and like imagine like how was this how did this thing come about like it it, it just i don't know there's so many unanswered questions that that make this whole experience on earth so kind of mystical and magical in, in my opinion yeah i mean that's incredible like how did it get there and how does it not run into us <laughs> yeah it, it it's i mean it's just one of those things. I'm like, yeah, I haven't really thought about the sun much. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's classic. Well, but, or by the way, all the planets even farther away, right? Like, yeah, I know. What I are mean, they doing over there? They're just doing circles. Yeah, it's but, uh, yeah, but it's it's just one of those things that, uh, that 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 just makes you kind of like go, okay, cool. I'm I'm part of something awesome here. Um, let's make the most of it. You know. Um, it just, I it just also want... helps with the. Oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. I think. The whole, you know, anxiety and worry, I, you know, more and more people are suffering from depression on earth than, you know, for me, I got nothing to lose. Like I'm going to die someday. We're all going to die. So, and I, for me, I believe I'm going somewhere, you know, it doesn't hurt. Like I'm either going to die and believe I'm not going somewhere. I'm going to die and believe I am. So it's not really hurting me trusting that I'm going somewhere better when I die. That helps with anxiety. That helps with depression because it doesn't matter. In the end of the world, I'm only on here for 80, 90 years, right? Where am I going to be at for eternity? <laughs> That's mm -hmm. what matters. So I think it helps with any depression, any worry. If something's falling apart right now, it's all good. I'm going to die someday and it's going to be fine. <laughs> so um, I think it helps along with that too. And I wish more and more people would have something or look for something to believe in and not get so caught up in the worries of the world. Great advice there. Great advice. The one thing I'd like to talk a bit about, like in, in terms of business that I, that I really like, um, and you, you've, you've touched on it a little bit, right. Is uh, relationship marketing and like using your face, right. Can you just talk to me about the importance of that? Well, I learned it in, you know, I guess the, garden bench business, my fitness business, my hockey coaching businesses. When I meet someone face to face, we instantly build some sort of relationship and 80, 90%, they become a client. Like when you meet someone face to face, if I meet someone and have a great conversation with them at a conference, they're, they're always going to become a client after like, it's a, a no brainer pretty much. It's so how can we do that on the internet? What's the next best thing? And when I first started, I came up with, how can I shake your hand through the webcam, right? 
Like, how can we build that better relationship like that? And the only way you can is through video. So that's how I started was like I mentioned, I reached out to people on LinkedIn and I said, Hey, can I interview you and share your story and your business on all the platforms out there? And most people said, yes, like it's, you know, free exposure, 15 minute interview, but we got to meet face to face. Like 50% of those people became a client after because now they had some sort of relationship with me. So that's when I started my YouTube channel. And I've been going really hard on this recently is how can you become the educator online, get online, get on camera and educate and teach, become the authority and the expert in your field, because you're not going to meet everyone face to face. You're not going to have hundreds of people show up to a webinar nowadays. No one, no one's going to make it live, but as long as they see your face that builds some sort of relationship, somehow they see your personality and for me, I'm boring on camera and I straight up say, Hey, if you want an exciting, you know, jump up and down video, go watch someone else. If you want education, if you want to actually learn how to do this, watch my boring video because you'll actually learn how to do it. So, you know, take who you are and run with it, show your personality, whether it's funny, whether it's um, smart, whether it's boring, you know, but when somebody watches that and they see the personality, you're I sign up clients on autopilot from YouTube every week. So um, it's just incredible when somebody comes to me and says, hey, Brad, I've been watching your videos for the past year and I'm finally ready to hire you. I'm thinking, wait a second, you haven't left one comment in a year. <laughs> I didn't even know you were watching my videos. They're like, oh yeah, I've been stalking you, but uh, I'm ready to become a client. Like that, that is so powerful. And um, we probably should get into people being nervous on camera next. Yeah. Um interesting thing there that you said, but was you don't really know who is watching, you know, and, and, and often people are like, like totally engaged in what you're doing, but you are, you have no idea, you know what I mean? Like, cause they're not commenting or even liking or whatever the story is. So how do you deal with that? Right? Like, how do you deal with the, I guess, talking to nobody? It, it sometimes feels like that. You're like, I'm, why am I even doing this? I feel like I'm talking to nobody, you know, but, but you know, yeah. What is your advice? Well, I want to encourage everyone watching this. If you're even thinking about building a business, like get on video, even if you're uncomfortable or nervous about it, it took me six months to make my first video. Every morning I'd wake up and say, all right, today's the day I'm making the video about this. And I was so confident by the time I got the camera and hit record, I'll do it tomorrow. I put it down six months every day. No, no, kept picking it up, changing my mind. And finally, my after six months, my first videos were awful. And um, I mean, getting in, I'm sorry, I forgot the, the question already, but um, getting on camera, even when you think no one's watching. Oh, when you start a YouTube channel, you have zero subscribers, by the way. I think Mr. Beast uploaded 300 videos before one of his videos went viral and they were all boring, random videos. So I think the mindset thing, Gareth, is the most important is when I got in the mindset of, all right, I'm not making these videos for clicks and views. I'm making these videos to educate. I think that's when it changed for me. I didn't build a YouTube video at first I did to get millions of subscribers. I quickly realized if you talk about business on YouTube, you're not getting millions of subscribers. You're getting thousands. So mindset is, all right, if it was back in the 80s, I'd have to go store to store and talk to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Now I can make a video and I don't care if 10 people watch it, 100 people watch it or 1,000 people watch it. It's still more than one person watching it. And even if only 10 people watch it, that's still, still a success in my book because I educated those 10 people and one of those 10 people could still become a client. So once you get in the mindset of more than one is better than anyone's ever had it in the world, right? And you don't need a million views to make money. You can educate 10 people at a time. You can educate 30 people, 50 and 100. I think that's all that matters. And expect those first five to 10 videos to get zero views. I mean, I still have some videos that get zero views. It's, it's more about it's more than one. That's all that matters. I think one of the most important things 
that you are touching on now is that the videos build trust, right? And like you said, it doesn't matter if you're exciting or boring or whatever. These are trust builders. And for me, one of the most essential things of any relationship, especially business, is trust. And those are people yep. that are going to invest in you. You know, they're, they're, they're watching you. They're saying, oh, cool, it's Brad. Yeah, he's really educating me, sharing his knowledge, et cetera. I actually really want to work with him. And it's because you built up that trust. And that's what the videos do. Because you can't hide. I mean, you can, but you can't really. You know, when you posted 400 videos, it's kind of hard to to hide your personality. Um, and, and people yep. are also not as stupid as we think. You know what I mean? Like they can see if you're like being genuine or you're just putting on a show. And, um, you know, that we've got it in our, in ourselves to understand this and to pick it up. So I think, uh, that's another really important reason for actually doing the video. Yeah. And also the, I think your question was, how can you make a video thinking no one's watching? Right. Yeah. I'd rather make a video with no one watching than stand on stage with a hundred people watching. <laughs> that's my personality. So it's a lot easier doing it that way, but you can always go and edit it as well too. Right. So at least, you know, you can edit, but for real, when I come back to that is as long as you get, once you get in the mindset of becoming the educator in your industry, it's so much easier. When I make my video, I just think of myself as a college professor on stage. Like I'm teaching my 30 students who aren't paying me a hundred grand a semester, <laughs> teaching my, my 30 students in the crowd here, um, as you know, they're students and they're on YouTube learning from me. So I'm just going to teach them knowing most likely they're not going to go implement it, but they're going to learn from me and then hire me to implement it for them. I like that a lot. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe tell people a little bit about the story that you, you mentioned at the start of this, where your current business automation links, you were trying to sell and it didn't go through and you kind of happy about that. Um, and then maybe just mention a little bit about what, um, automation links is. Yeah. appreciate that. Um, you know, I built the business over the last eight years. Uh, last year I decided to sell it and last year it was in scaling mode. That's when we hired, a, um, employees, um, before I was just working with contractors. So last year we hired four or five employees. We doubled our clientele, we added an extra service. And all at the same time, my stress levels skyrocketed. <laughs> uh, my amount of time I was putting in skyrocketed and I wasn't happy with it. And that's when I realized, all right, I really don't like building a business that has a bunch of employees because um, now I'm working double, I'm working overtime. The business was in a great spot to sell. So we decided to sell it because the next thing we wanna do is my wife um, is a real does real estate flipping, so she buys, renovates, and sells homes. Um, so I wanted to go in all in and support her on that next. So we listed the business for sale, have all the employees, very stressed out. The business sale gets all the way to the point where the offer was made, the contract was signed, the lawyers were introduced, and we were gonna. We I signed my paperwork, he was signing his paperwork, and all of a sudden. We didn't hear from him for a week. Um, I'm looking at my wife. I'm like, what? He just disappeared. Like, and then we found out he was in Maui during the Maui wildfires. That's where his home is. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I looked at my wife. I'm like, God killed him. <laughs> no it's way. Like, that, he did. He's still alive. But, you know, at the time we didn't hear from him. So I'm like, well, that's just God giving us a sign. We're not supposed to supposed to sell the business. So God either killed them or something happened. Like half jokingly, I didn't realize he was right in Maui at the time. Um, so he backed out of the deal because of his home. Um, he's still alive, but the deal back fell through in August at the moment, at the time, the couple of weeks leading up to it, I started getting some red flags, some, some just weird feelings, some nervousness. I didn't know why. So then I've started looking out for signs, right? That was a huge sign right there. So actually when it, the deal fell through, I felt a huge sense of relief and I didn't know why. I'm like, what the heck? That was right around the time when I was starting to think about the whole Taylor Swift idea. 
sticking with something long enough, right? And I'm like, I've had this for eight years. Everybody knows that I'm the advertising genius. I've got hundreds of clients. Um, they're all happy. They all enjoy working with me. What if we just scaled back and we turn this into a comfortable lifestyle business? We didn't have to grow it and scale it to be huge, but I've already got my name. I already have the SEO rankings. I got all my YouTube videos. I've got all my affiliates. I've got all my clients that get word of mouth referrals. So what if we just scaled back and made it enjoyable while still doing our other business? And that's when I started really thinking, all right, I haven't stuck it through. I'm quitting. You know, after eight years, I'm, I'm quitting something that's successful because I was uncomfortable. So just because I was uncomfortable doesn't mean I need to back out. And so that's when I realized, all right, I think this is meant to be. I think I'm supposed to keep this, turn it into more of a lifestyle business and keep doing what we're doing because we enjoy it. I actually do enjoy it when there's not stress there. So um, now I'm just going to continue growing it. Happy days, but that's, that's, that's cool, man. There's a, you know, there's a difficult decisions to make as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure, but I'm sure you're going to do like amazingly well. Like I, I, I watch all your stuff and, uh, read everything you write and, um, I, you, you share, you really do educate, you know, and that's what's, uh, that's, what's amazing. So, um, so thank you for that. Uh, I, I was wondering like if people wanted to sort of get in touch with you, uh, where could they find out about you? And then off the back of that, like, what are you most excited about uh, in the coming months? Yeah. Um, real quick. I wanted to just finish up on that. My partners and I bought an e-commerce business last November, something I wasn't passionate about. And we turned it and sold it six months later for a small profit, but it was not only stressful, but it's not something I was passionate about and did not enjoy. So I want to just tell the viewers, if you're thinking about buying into a business, starting a business, that's why I just want to keep harping on, do only do something you're passionate about and you get excited about and something you'll be happy about for the next 20 years. Because making a wrong business choice like that set me back, set my relationships back, set me back financially and time-wise caused unneeded anxiety all for something I didn't enjoy doing. Now, if I enjoyed doing it, it would have been great, but I didn't. I was just looking for the next best thing. So think about it. Sit down, take a minute. Will you really enjoy? And I think set that 20-year timeline. Yeah, you can do a business for two or three years, easy. But can you actually do something for 20 years? And if you say no, it's probably not a good investment or a good business to get into. So um, everyone can, I started building my personal brand on um, Twitter, which you, we've been following. But anything with automation links, automation links is everywhere. We advertise, we set up low cost ads. A lot of people have the theory that ads are expensive. Um, my theory is let's use ads to just build that trust and that authority through your videos, through your blogs, through your website, through social media for a low cost. Like we have some clients that just spend 500 bucks a month on ads and their audience signs up with them and pays them and they get a great return on it. So um, that's really what we we preach there for automation links. Next year, I'm excited. We we started a nonprofit. So we're going to keep pushing our nonprofit and that's exciting. We help uh, families, uh, women and families in need with, with housing. That's what my wife does. So she's always supported me with my business. Um, we work together on that. So I'm excited for next year to just start supporting her more and more and helping her uh, with helping families and also, you know, doing so with real estate. We've, we've um, bought and flipped two homes already. We placed um, two families with kids in the homes. And that's such a great feeling being able to help people like that. Wow, buddy, that's really cool, man. Um, you guys sound like a power couple. So uh, congrats for that, bud. Uh, my my last question is, um, what does being ridiculously human actually mean to you, Ed? I think in um, if you're open to changing yourself and always looking to improve yourself, I feel like you inside in your head, in your heart, in your mental state, you feel powerful. You feel like a different human. You feel, I don't want to say more authoritative, but feel more confident. You 
are going to be at another level above your peers. If you are always looking to improve yourself first, um, and I think that's going to just make you a ridiculous human when you when you're that confident and you keep working on yourself and and bettering yourself for the good. Fantastic, man! Really good advice. I I just wanted to say like a, a massive thanks to you, Brad. Like this has been such a cool conversation, but uh, I I know we we haven't touched on on certain things, but you know what I mean, like the value that you brought, um, the, just, there was just so much in there, you know what I mean? And and you, you come across as just like such a cool bloke, you know what I mean? Like, and, and I can see why people, you know, want to work with you, why people like you. And, um, I, I'm really like, sort of, I know it sounds weird to say, but like, I'm, I'm proud of you, you know, for like, the some of the tough things that you've that you've mentioned in here you know like removing toxic friendships changing habits every six months um you know being like very sort of self-reflective you know especially with things like your wife and having good communication and and tough conversations and looking at yourself and going okay cool this is me i need to change you know and i think there's like if more people can be like that uh, then this is going to be like such an awesome sort of planet. You know what I mean? Like if we all just a bit more self-reflective and, and willing to kind of, uh, change, um, who we are as uh, so that we become a better person. Um, and, and you definitely are somebody leading the pack when it comes to that. Uh, this has just been such a, a great conversation, but, um, and thanks, man. thank you for, for your time and for your expertise and wisdom. It's, it's been really cool, man. I started um, this when I heard this great quote, always blame yourself before blaming others. And ever since I heard that quote, I've really been self-reflective on, I've never actually tried to change myself first. I always try to like change other people. You're doing this wrong. Or, you know, what if I change first and lead the way, then they will follow. And if if anyone watching this, if you want to just feel better inside mentally, you know, in your heart, your mental state, change something about yourself for the better. And you're going to see the difference. You're going to feel better about yourself. You're going to feel more confident and you're going to see one other person change. Then when you go change another thing about yourself and improve that, you'll see five more people follow you and just continue growing on that. You've, it's crazy. The, the mindset and the change you feel when you're always trying to improve yourself in hope somebody follows you and, and learns from that. So appreciate the time and it's been great. Coach Brad, you're a good man. You're a wise man. Thank you very much, my boy. (laughs) I appreciate it. Good speaking with you. Thanks, everyone.